Brother Jim came up and, and prayed over me and, and gave me a word. And man, it was, it was much needed because I've got a message I'm working on that I'm excited about. I'm not 100% excited about today's message, but uh, it's God's word and it's what he told me to do. So we're going to be obedient to him. If you think that we should be obedient to him, say amen one time. Amen. amen. All right. We'll see if you say that afterwards. No, just kidding. Uh, we're going to talk about Israel today for just a little bit. Turn me, if you will, to Isaiah 64, Isaiah chapter 64, and before you stand for the reading of God's Word, look around. There's many faces that are not with us today. Look around, see who they are, pray for them, call them, tell them you love them, uh, you miss them, and you wish they were here, right? Uh, let them know that uh, they are loved. Uh, for those faces we haven't seen in a while, it's good to see you too. Isaiah chapter 64, stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to begin with verse 1. Isaiah is, uh, in my opinion, praying. So this is the prayer of Isaiah. You've heard me mention a couple of these verses on occasion, but never actually a breakdown, I don't think. Um, oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. And when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil. To make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we look not for, thou camest down, the mountain flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by ear, neither have the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him." Now, when we quote that verse from the New Testament, we quote it about heaven, right? But it's not what it's actually talking about. We quote about, eye has not seen and ear has not heard what he's got prepared for us. Well, he's actually talking about a rebuke from God, if you will, in the original writing of it. But let me move on. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those that remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wroth. For we have sinned in those in continuance, and we shall be saved. But, if, but we are all of an unclean thing, as all our righteousness as as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon the name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us. And has consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou our potter. And we are all the work of thy hand. Be not wroth, very sore, O Lord. Neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beg thee or we beseech thee. We are thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness. Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation. Brother Nelson, will you bless the reading of the word? Amen. You can be seated. Have you ever prayed a prayer like this to God? Have you ever literally prayed a prayer like this to God? And I mean, we're going to break this prayer down. I'm just going to literally go through it. And we're going to break down the words of Isaiah. And remember today, we're not talking about the church today. We're talking about Israel. So I say that for this reason. If this hits your heart today, maybe that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And maybe it has nothing to do with me sitting here trying to tell you the church needs repaired. What the truth is, is this. This is what was going on in Israel in those days. So he begins, if you will, his prayer like this. He said, oh God, that you would rend the heavens, that you would come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. And when the melting fire burneth, the fire caused the water to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things, verse 3 which we look not for, thou camest down the mountain, flowed down at thy presence. If we're examining this prayer, he says, Lord, we need your help. 
We're in trouble here. We need the mountains to be melted down. We need you to tear them apart. We need you to rip open the mountains. We need you down here. Have you seen what is going on? We are hurting. Things are falling apart. And the people do not even know that you are God. That's a serious prayer. That's a prayer of, of touching heaven, right? That's a prayer that's going to reach out to God. Doug, I think about me and you with a prayer like that when we want God to heal our dog. Or say, you know what, Blake, little kid, the dog drank antifreeze, and I'm in there, and the doctor says, make it comfortable. He's coughing up parts of his intestines. And, the, and the, the, that little boy's prayer says, God, I don't want my dog to die. Heal my dog. And the crazy thing lived 10 more years. That's, but you know what? That's an earnest prayer. That's not a ritualistic prayer. That's not something that he was being serious with God. But when you get serious with God or when he got serious with God for Israel, he understands that there's more than one side to that. He says, God, see what is happening. Why are you letting this happen? Pause. Happy birthday, Steve. Happy anniversary, Nichols and McKinnons. And anybody else that had a birthday coming up, I was supposed to do that and forgot. Moving on. <laughs> Yay. 20 years, right? 20 years. It felt best three years of your life. <laughs> Picking and choosing days. Um, he says, God, what happens when you show up? God, you're awesome. When you show up, things happen. Mountains move. Water bulls. Everybody knows that it's you. You ever have those miracles that they don't know if it's something you did or something God did? This is the kind of miracle that only God can do, right? This is those type things. And he says, the world knows that you are the one true God when you show up for those that wait on you. They know that you are the one true God. When the doctor says there's no hope, and yet hope comes anyway, they know that it's God. But Isaiah understood that Israel was in a bad place, and he literally begins a prayer to God, melt the mountains that are between us. But then he's going to talk about the mountains that are between them, beginning with verse 5. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. Those who remember thee in thy ways, behold, thou art wroth, for we have sinned those in continuance, and we shall be saved. But we are all as an unclean thing. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon the name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee, for thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. God, I need you to show up in my situation. God, I need you to melt the mountains, Isaiah says. For Israel, we need you to come down. We need all of our enemies to know that you are the one true God. But God, the mountains that are between us are the sin in our lives. The mountains that are between us, God. He said, for those that do worship and do good, verse 5, for those that meet you in worship, you will meet them. For those that do good, you will do good unto them. But God, we are not only just sinning, but we are continually sinning. We are continuing in our sin. And here's what he said. God, if we would just worship you the way you deserve it, and if we would just do what we know is right and true before you, you would meet us. You would show up and you would do what we need to have done. And the reason you're not is because the sin of your people. And it's not just a sin, it's continual sin. Remember, we're not talking about you guys, we're talking about Israel here. He says, but you are wroth with us. 
Because we have sinned. We don't worship you the way we should worship you. Listen to what he says in verse 5. Thou meetest him that rejoiceth and worketh righteousness. I believe Israel was meditating on every little dot, jot and tittle of what everybody did wrong along the way. They had their BVDs in a bunch, if I can say it like that. They were all upset and wadded up, and they were mad, and they were angry, yet they were saying, God, would you fix this for us? The enemy is attacking us. And I believe God was sitting on the edge of his seat wanting to help them, but their sin paused God in his tracks. Because what? They wanted God to do was to move the mountains out of your lives. Boy, I know this doesn't relate to you guys, but for me, so many times in my life, I'm like Israel. I'm like, God, will you help me? I need you. Please, God, why won't you do this? And in the back of my head, that thing pops up. And he says, why won't you worship me? Why do you want to justify that little sin in your life? Carry that thing with you and then expect me to stop all of heaven for your behalf. Ouch. Is that what you said? <laughs> this isn't about you. This is about Israel. Isaiah explains it like this. He said, it's not because we sinned, but because we continue to sin we need to be saved we are unclean and our righteousness is as filthy rags I almost convinced God to let me preach the goo goo message I wanted to preach this morning that's not true at all he never wavered once and at 4 o'clock this morning when I was disagreeing with him He said, because Israel sinned and continued to sin, because their righteousness was filthy before me. Do you know what that means? It's like a leaf in the wind. Do you know what that literally means? And I'm staying with my notes closer today. Bear with me. But he literally said, because they did everything that they thought was right in their own eyes. They justified everything they wanted to do the way they wanted to do it. And they told me, God, that they want me to bless that. They want me to melt mountains. They want me to tear down. But all the while, they want to walk around with their righteous nose stuck in the air going, we're God's chosen. And he said, you are God's chosen. But you are not living according to the way I called you to live. And I cannot release my blessing. I cannot loose on you everything I want to. And you are living with mountains destroying you because of the sin in your life. Talking to Israel. Anybody like me got stuff going on in the back of your head thinking, man, I shouldn't be Man, that shouldn't be, oh, I, uh, I, uh, no, that can't be the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He's talking to Israel. This has nothing to do with me. Let me move on. Verse 5, hindered God from coming down. He said, God, you will meet us when we do what you call us to do and worship the way you call us to worship. We will meet you. You will meet with us. Psalms 51 said, David said, Against you and you alone have I sinned, O Lord. Isaiah says they continued sinning. They didn't repent before God and abstain from sin. It's one thing to repent. It's another to repent and abstain. James said to those that know to do good and do it not, it is sin. That means Israel wasn't doing what they were supposed to. Verse 6. Isaiah states our righteousness as as filthy rags. Isaiah says to God when he is speaking and communing, maybe to Israel in front of Israel, he says to them, God, 
You will not show up and honor us because our righteousness disgusts you. Because we're living out the way we see righteousness, not the way you proclaimed righteousness. We're living it our way, not your way. And therefore, God's laws have been brought down to man's level. And we expect, or not us, Israel expects God to honor that. Aren't you glad this was written for them? They set their own standards of righteousness and expected God to come. And I believe he was sitting on the edge of his seat, weeping for his people, wanting to help them. But he said, I told you exactly how. But you won't let go of the sin. You won't let go of the anger, the animosity, whatever it is that they were going through. You won't let go of that sin. And until you let go, I want to help you. I want to tear the mountains down. I want your prayer to move mountains, but I can't. Then he says their righteousness. Matthew 5, 20, Jesus warned that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Jesus did not say, except your righteousness be my righteousness. He said, your works, not us, them. He said, except your righteousness rise above. That means doing the right thing when it don't feel good means doing the right thing when I don't want to, Sterling. They attended the temple. They gave their tithe. They kept the feast. They read the law. But they did not have a relationship with God. It's almost like they would say it like this. God, we love you with all of our heart. You talk to Moses and he can talk to us. Don't get close to us. You and Moses hang out on the mountain, but don't come down here because we, we, we mountain gold to make a cow. I, I know you said don't make a golden image, but we're getting rid of our earrings. Verse 7. God is not coming down because he's not been asked to come down. Do you know why I believe Israel didn't truly ask God? Because they didn't want to be humble like Isaiah was. They didn't want to get real with God. Can I use you for a second, coach? You can fuss at me tomorrow when I fix your mower. Um, they didn't want to say, God, I'll give up the alcohol if you'll heal my dog. God, I'll get real with you if you'll get real with me. How many years? Sober. 25, 24, praise God. Because the righteousness of Israel was, God, we want you to do everything we're asking you to do, but we will not make a move on your behalf unless we see you move first or not even then at times. Did he heal your dog? Did you honor your part? <laughs> I know you did. Verse 7, God is not coming down because they haven't asked. Do you know why people won't ask God in a serious form? Because they don't want to hear what he's got to say about it. Come on, get real. I don't want to ask God about my pet peeve. Because he might answer. And he might tell me my pet peeve needs to go on down the road and get a pet rock instead. Mine's one of those, well, how do I forgive somebody? And we're talking about Israel. Not, well, how do I forgive them when they keep doing it over and over and over? He said, have you looked at Calvary? I forgave them while they were driving the nails. I forgave them while they were whipping me. I asked my father with my dying breath to not hold it against them. How can you not forgive? He said that to Israel, not us. Let me move on. Y'all still love me? 
Some of you never loved me in the first place. (laughs) They didn't actually ask him in a genuine form. Scripture says he'll give us the desires of our heart, but until our heart lines up with him, the Bible suggests these things. They cared more about being religious than they did about him and his will. 1 Peter 1 says, gird up your loins. It didn't say for God to do it for you. It said, gird up your loins. We're not talking to us, though. Break up the fallow ground. Jeremiah 4, 3. Stir up the gifts that are within you. 2 Timothy. He said to them, stir up the gifts. Isaiah wrote, there is none among us that will stir themselves up to get to God. God, why won't you melt the mountains? Because I'm not willing to stir the gravel so you can move the mountain. But it's Israel, not us. Let me read the last few verses and I'm done. You've got plenty of time. But now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou art our potter. And we all work, we are the work of thy hand. Be not wroth very sore, O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee. We beg you, we are your people. Our cities are in wilderness. Zion is a wilderness. Jerusalem is a desolation. He said, God, we are the potter's. We are the clay, you are the potter. How many times you prayed a prayer that said, God, if you need to break me and start over, break me. I don't pray prayers like that because I'm afraid he will. That means something in me needs tuned up or I wouldn't be stressing over that, right? But this isn't about us. This is about Israel. We're clear and free, right? We live under grace. None of this stuff applies. Unless the convicting power of the Holy Spirit is stirring your heart. When the potter makes a vessel and the vessel doesn't work for what it was intended for, he can break that vessel. He can start all over and he can remold it and he can bring it up to what it's supposed to be. But the breaking process for the vessels is not a good thing. But he tells Israel, and Isaiah is praying to God, we're willing to let you remold us, reshape us, remake us. We just need your help. We're begging you to forgive our sin, forgive our holier-than-thou attitude. God, we're asking you if necessary, remake us. Because I've made your righteousness what I want it to be, and you never changed it. I made your holy standard, Israel of course, made your holy standard what they wanted it to be, not what you said it had to be. You said you can't forgive me If I can't forgive others, yet I say I don't have to forgive them. Forgive me, Lord. You say things in your book, Lord, like lust is in. If you look at someone, that's lust. If you look at them with a lustful eye. Well, now I'm going to justify if it's not the second look or the third look or the fourth look. It's okay, right? Because that's what he said, right? He actually said, if your eye offend thee, pluck it out. Israel had to come to a place before God could move on their behalf. Let's just say the nation are crying for God to move. But they're not willing to move towards him. To see him move and fix the nation. This week we remember 9-11. We live in a nation that is under attack constantly. 
Let me clarify that for the camera. We live in a Christian nation. And if we're not careful, history will repeat itself. Where the Israelites got so complacent that the nation was destroyed. And all the while telling how good they were in the process of it. Israel was destined to fall time and time again. Because God said, do it this way. And they said, we're going to do it this way. They sinned. They sinned. And the sin was continual. And the prophet Isaiah understood that the only way back to God was to tear down the mountains that was between us. And for Israel, the mountain was sin. For Israel, the mountain was self-righteousness. For Israel, it was justifying whatever they chose to justify and then not asking God to solve it because that required repentance on their part. That's a taboo word now, right? Repentance. It requires repentance to see a move of God like that. Well, God says He's always with me. He is, and He's heartbroken At the state of Israel. And if history repeats itself. He might be heartbroken at the state of America today. Let me simplify it. God had not moved for Israel. Because of sin. Plain and simple. The sins they didn't talk about, they were doing the right things in public because of self-righteousness, because they hadn't asked Him with a humble heart. And for some in this room today, I can attach you to this, you're waiting for God to move your mountain because it's just not God's timing yet. So that means there's no sin in your life, no self-righteousness, None of those things in your life. Your life's glitch free. But God's timing hasn't happened yet. Isaiah said. That if we would just stir ourselves up to get to him. He would melt the mountains and the world would know he's God in our lives. But then Isaiah went a little farther and he said, But the mountains are my fault, not God's. The mountains are Israel's fault, not God's. Because they've self-justified. This morning I'm going to ask you a question. This is really the only thing that applies to you. Is God stirring your heart at all? Because he sure tore mine out, coach. I ask him to move. Then I start remembering all the things I need to clean up. And for him to get real and move on my behalf, I got to get some of the junk out. And I don't like that. So I'll just live here on the edge. Where I got a ticket to heaven, at least I hope I do, and I'll struggle through till I get there. And all the while, the God of all creation is sitting on the edge, going, I made it so simple. I laid it out so easy. I feel just Worship and follow me like I ask you to. I will defeat and destroy the enemies that you've been battling forever. Six 
thousand years of earth history and Israel is still fighting the same enemies that they began with in the beginning. I'm 53 years old and I got the same enemies I had and it ought not be that way. If I want God to melt the mountains, I've got to give him the mountain to melt. But the water's going to boil. And it's going to hurt. And it's going to be painful. But they will know that you are God. And you will forgive us. And you will save us. And you will restore what the enemy has stolen. Because you're a good, good father. If I can just learn to submit to you the way Isaiah submitted for Israel. Father, I come to you today and I thank you for your word. If you notice, Lord, I didn't say I like it. Because I don't like all that you have to say to me. But I thank you that you love me enough to say it. I thank you that it's not about my righteousness but yours. Not about my holiness but yours. I thank you for your son Jesus that died on Calvary for me. I don't know why you love me enough to create a child that grew up perfect and then have him crucified for me. I don't understand that love, but I thank you for that love today. Let your sweet Holy Spirit touch our hearts, even if it hurts, even if it relates, Lord. Don't give up on us as Isaiah said. Forgive our sins and don't always hold it against us. Wash us and let us be white as snow. Meet the needs of your people today from salvation to deliverance and everything in between. As your humble clay servant, I beg you, in your precious name. Stand with me if you will. We're going to play one verse of a song.